Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Catherine Wild, President and CEO of the Partnership for New York City, a membership organization comprised of nearly 300 CEOs from New York City's top corporate investment and entrepreneurial firms dedicated to enhancing and maintaining New York City's global position as a leader of commerce, culture, and innovation. Catherine has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Catherine, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So maintaining New York's leadership in a global world that is changing so rapidly is, is quite a challenge, and there are so many different aspects to it. Let's start off by talking about the organization and its mission and its constituent parts, and then let's talk about the tactics, the tactical elements that result in the fulfillment of a strategy of maintaining New York City's global leadership. The partnership came out of the 1970s fiscal crisis the city and all of urban America faced. And after that time, David Rockefeller felt that business had really been asleep at the switch. And he understood and was one of the first to really understand that great world cities are the essential platform for a global economy and for business in a global economy. So. He organized the partnership at the beginning of the 1980s with the idea that the private sector had to provide attention and leadership to keeping and maintaining New York as a great world city. And that was a point in time at which um, it was suffering in every respect, both fiscally, in terms of services, its neighborhoods had been destroyed, abandonment, arson. So, uh, he set out an agenda that this was going to be business. So we think we say the partnership is not a chamber of commerce. It is business working in the interests of the city. He brought together the CEOs of all the global corporations, many of the local real estate and other firms in uh, of Wall Street into the partnership. Uh, the CEOs are our members, our partners. It's not the government affairs person. It's, it's the chief executive. And he really established a pattern for an organization where uh, of that is dedicated to great corporate citizenship. And David himself has a very interesting and diverse set of interests in culture, in the living environment of the city, in the, uh, the business, the economic aspects of, of a great city. Uh, what, what is interesting to me is that greatness is not unidimensional. It's not one thing. It's, it is a number of different aspects that come together that create this environment that incubates great businesses, great institutions, great citizens. It's a combination of different elements. New York is, uh, and great world cities are distinguished by the fact that they are really headquarters for a number of key industries, cultural institutions, universities, academic institutions, medical, the medical institutions. So it's a combination, and particularly today, you mentioned the rapidly changing economy uh, with uh, technology and innovation of being at the core, it's really important that we have all those components because obviously great ideas come out of that combination. And often, and it shouldn't be ignored, the role of government as well. And so it's the leadership of the individuals in both the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, and government putting that together, having them on the same page, which is really the key to, we think, the secret to su success of both maintaining a great world city and having the flexibility to change. And everything starts with people. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned the genesis of, of the partnership for New York City coming out of the f uh, financial crisis of, uh, of the 70s and New York's terrible, terrible spiral into what could have been a catastrophe and, and ended up uh, being um, resulting in the New York of today. But at that time, we had issues of safety, just simple public safety. We had issues of, of destroyed infrastructure. We had issues... Um, Private disinvestment. We lost over a million people. We lost half our Fortune 500 companies in the 70s. It was an it was an enormous trauma, and many people uh, bet that we would never recover. The public policy of the day was planned shrinkage. Uh, we were thinking how to close down uh, schools and subways, and uh, it's amazing when you think today. And and uh, today, a, a third of the people that are in New York, living in New York today, weren't here. A decade ago. Um, and New York could have become what has ended up happening to Detroit. And Detroit now is rising again, is, is clamoring its way out of that, that situation. But Detroit has gone through decades of shrinkage and, and disinvest, uh, disinvestment. New York, however, was able somehow, through engaging this creative talent, to, 
to shift. So let's talk about how that, that functioned and how that continues to function as, in, as embodied in your organization. Well, it's a matter of leadership on the private and public sector sides. Uh, one is uh, it was people who were practical, who weren't worried about politics or ideology. They really saw that a great world city was, as I said, an essential platform for global business, but it was also a place that people lived and that had the uh, ability to accommodate a population that um, that was of mixed income, of diversity, that was um, uh, truly urban in the modern sense. So in, in a sense, it was, it was um, if you take a look at the government side, you had the great Ed Koch and, and, uh, and his team for all of his idiosyncrasies and, and unique uh, aspects. He is a person who defied a particular type of definition, intensely practical, but also a politician. And then you had people like David Rockefeller and other CEOs coming together who were business leaders, people who came out of that tradition and philanthropic traditions to come together to, to start to discuss Yeah, uh, one, th one thing that was interesting about David Rockefeller and Ed Koch, they did not agree on everything. But uh, they did agree that a strong middle class was essential to the survival of the city. And uh, when Ed Koch campaigned for mayor, he really did so on the basis of restoration of a middle class. Mm -hmm. And David Rockefeller's initiative with the partnership, the first thing he did was undertake the rebuilding of the neighborhoods and rebuilding home ownership housing to bring a middle class back to the city to allow people that could emerge out of the housing projects to own a home, to invest in the city. Uh, so they had very much a shared vision for the city, including uh, the the details of what should what had to happen to keep the city great and that was really what the partnership was that's the foundation the partnership was built on. and let's not forget the advocacy in Albany that was designed to to shift some of this um, sort of very uh, negative perspective that New York was doomed to become a shrinking aspect of of the state that instead New York was, was going to remain the, uh, an engine, a, a, a driving force within the state, and that there was not only hope, but it, it was hope that justified invent, investment. Well, in fact, one of the key elements that assured the survival and, and resurgence of the city was the huge investment made in the 1980s in the transportation infrastructure. Right. And Dick Ravitch, who was appointed by Hugh Carey to chair the uh, MTA at that time and to really remake it, uh, did that and he gives full credit to David Rockefeller and the leadership, early leadership of the partnership. He brought them down at five in the morning to see the subways and what was happening there and got them on the phone to the Republican head of the state senate with whom Rockefeller had a long and close relationship with and he was able to uh, get the funding that was necessary to make the large investment in starting the subways and the, the whole transportation system back on the road to recovery. And we all know that that infrastructure is an essential piece of the great city, a safe city, a city that provides access and mobility through its transportation system. And then on top of that, all the services and amenities that are necessary to uh, attract great talent here. And infrastructure continues to be an emphasis, a programmatic emphasis, emphasis of, of the partnership. The partnership is focused on the economy, infrastructure, and public education. Uh, talk a little bit about how your programs unfold and, and, and work within the context of, uh, of your mission. The partnership has, over the years, done a series of programmatic initiatives. Uh, we started when, because of David Rockefeller's interest in bringing the middle class back to the city and reinforcing that population. We started uh, with the development of affordable home ownership housing in low-income areas throughout the five boroughs. We worked in partnership with the city, state, and federal government, with organized labor, and with community-based nonprofit development corporations to really be the catalyst for the renaissance of communities that had uh, been devastated during the urban crisis, burned down, and we took those vacant lots and rebuilt them as home ownership housing, um, repopulated those neighborhoods. After that, we worked with uh, creating the investment fund, which originally its first project was bringing 
commercial strips back in those communities because most of the businesses, the jobs had fled uh, with the loss of population. So the, the, the investment fund, which was started in the mid 90s, was investing in the first projects we invested in were building retail centers and mixed use buildings on abandoned commercial strips throughout the communities. And then the investment fund went on and has uh, continued today uh, in, uh, we were very involved in creating Silicon Alley 1.0, which was bringing uh, the tech innovation community, which had been largely on the West Coast, but there was an opportunity with the uh, emergence of digital media and e-commerce for uh, New York City to have an opportunity because of the creative and media talent here and the fact that we had the advertising industry, which was the source of revenues for these businesses. So we put that together, bringing industry, uh, the new young entrepreneurial talent, really helping create an early stage venture capital industry that did not exist here before that. We were later stage growth capital. And, uh, and that, was, that effort was led by Henry Kravis, co-founder of KKR, and um, leadership from across the business and financial community. Uh, they all contributed a million dollars to capitalize a hundred plus million dollar fund, which we still have today. We have paid all our expenses and had a decent rate of return on a social investment fund that's investing uh, today in uh, both not-for-profit uh, enterprises, in uh, businesses in distressed communities and efforts to support distressed communities, and then also in growth sectors, potential growth sectors. Bioscience is a big area of investment, for example. You also have a voice as a consultant and advisor because of the complementary aspect of, of being a business that does business here, that provides employment, that, that also helps to uh, advocate for infrastructure, you actually have an advocacy role as well. How does that unfold? Does it always unfold within the context of the of the partnership or or do you have a a um, a situation where you you form coalitions with other uh, organizations, perhaps labor and so on, in order to uh, advance an agenda that might be in the interest of of different parties? Well, we try and keep our agenda to those areas that affect um, the economy and, if, and affect education mm -hmm. and infrastructure. So we have a focused agenda. But what we've done is we have tried to establish ourselves as a resource rather than an adversary or a lobbyist. We try and be thought of as a resource of expertise. So when we take a position on an issue, we don't do it with uh, the attitude of a trade association right. or a chamber of commerce. So this is not to basically promote a specific business for-profit agenda. It's, it's a very important point and, and it keeps you very centered. I hope so. When our board, um, and they, our board actually, when they're describing the organization, they say when we come to the partnership, we take off our company hat, our industry hat, and we put on our New York City hat. And so the and it doesn't mean that some of the things we're advocating for are not in the interests of business and of employers because they are because that's very important to the city. But we try and balance that. We, for example, have advocated for. A, a significant increase in the minimum wage in New York City and state, the federal government having failed to, done, to do so. Um, and that's in the business interests of employers here because it creates a much more stable uh, workforce, but it also comes with the cost. But as New Yorkers, it's very much in the interest of having employees who can live here, who at least make a certain wage so that they can afford to remain within proximity of the city and, and contribute in their way as well. And it's also a recognition of the reality that while we've had, particularly since the, um, in, since the financial crisis and the Great Recession, we've had a rebound in the economy, we've had right. a rebound in employment rates, but we haven't had any wage growth. And, uh, and so obviously while we would prefer, most of our members would be prefer that market forces fixed everything, they are practical and non-ideological enough to notice that market forces don't fix everything and you need intervention at times and we're very quick to step forward and say when we think that's the case in the interests of a better city 
and a stronger society. And that's a role the partnership, I think, has distinguished itself as a business organization in playing in uh, New York City and state. It hasn't always made us popular in uh, various quarters around the country, but it's something we've done. We've also been big champions of comprehensive immigration reform, uh, a path to citizenship for unauthorized uh, immigrants here. And so that's, there are a number of areas where the partnership has taken uh, what are often considered uh, uh, stands against the stereotype of business. We think that, um, in fact, it's a real reflection of the fact that business is really concerned about the broader community. And um, we, we try and stand up for that principle. Another area where you've taken some very interesting positions has to do with the impact on climate change, particularly in lower New York and the, and the dangers of, of flooding and the dangers to the infrastructure um, that do, that, uh, do require some, some pre-planning um, to increase New York City's resilience against extreme weather events. It's, it, 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 it well, very it's, it, it, they're hard to ignore. I mean, uh, lower Manhattan was significantly underwater in right. Superstorm Sandy uh, a couple years ago. So uh, if, any, if anyone was ignoring the threat to our city, uh, as a result of climate change and extreme weather, they got it then. But in fact, there was a uh, long-term program that we were active in put in place by Mayor Bloomberg to make sure that New York City was um, taking significant steps uh, to reduce its carbon footprint. And the uh, again, the global community, a uh, global business community, have been real leaders in this area, not just in New York, but all over the world. And I think that um, it's, a, it's an example of where business has, has provided uh, an, excellent, uh, an excellent model of leadership. So you go from, from having um, a city that is a hospitable place for economic development to the very mundane issues of preventing flooding and collecting refuse, uh, this, this entire panoply that New Yorkers, these are all details that are very important to New Yorkers. This is not a, a, uh, a situation where the organization is simply uh, working on issues that affect business or elites or one segment of society versus another segment of society. These are, whether it's education or infrastructure or economic development, these are issues that really affect us all. If we're going to live and do business in this city, the city needs to be strong for the citizens who live here. Absolutely, and I would say we haven't talked much about education, but also what defines a great world city today is the talent that you can attract there and that you can grow there. And so one of the elements that we've been very active with, and particularly starting to work with Mayor de Blasio on in a very intense way, is preparing young people for careers. And uh, the demands of our workplace and of the jobs today have changed so much increasingly requiring higher education and STEM skills, uh, technical skills, mathematics skills, that this has really been an area where employers are jumping in and we're gonna try and make this a very big push with Mayor de Blasio because it is certainly the uh, most constructive way to go about uh, solving the problem of income inequality that has been a uh, a centerpiece of, of his concerns, of the mayor's concerns, and it's one that the business community shares and we are, uh, we have uh, worked very closely with uh, his administration in recent months to try and craft a program where employers of the city can take a much more active role in providing uh, not just the curriculum, but also internships, work experience for kids, mentoring for kids, and, uh, and a real pipeline to, to both college and careers. It's a powerful aspect. By having homegrown people who are educated here, who love the city, who put their home in the city, who have no desire to leave, to go anywhere else, it creates a stickiness, a, a, a retention of talent that can be so powerful in terms of ensuring that New York maintains its leadership position in the world. I'm so glad that you brought this topic to the fore. Catherine Wilde, thank you so much for explaining to us the work of the Partnership for New York City and for your great contributions to this fabulous place. <laughs> and thank you so much for your insight. Well, thank you for having me.